Uh, good morning, church. It is, or good afternoon, church. It is good to be with you. Headmaster in chicken wings, what a kind of introduction, hey? But it is, it is so good to be here with you this morning, and I hope that we are going to have uh, some fun together looking at the scriptures, understanding uh, what message God has in store for us today. He is risen. Those three words, he is risen. What three life-changing words. This morning, I would love to ask you, do you feel like your eyes are open? Do you feel like your heart is burning inside of you? Do you see that all that life has to offer and does it excite you? We are at the beginning of a four-part series we're launching today called Jesus is Greater. And we're going to be looking at this in all sorts of ways, but looking at the post-resurrection experiences, the post-resurrection experiences that Jesus made to different disciples at different times and asking, well, what does that mean for our lives today? What does that mean for our lives today? Today, I'd like to look specifically at how Jesus is greater than our confusion. Have you ever felt confused? This is the sermon for you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much uh, that through your spirit, you are here present with us. And Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes, that our hearts would burn as we discover something new about you as we discover something that will change the way that we view the world and live our lives. We pray that you would open our eyes. In your name, Jesus. Amen. I really do find myself confused quite often. In fact, more than is probably natural. I find myself confused over complicated things, but also things that you may find very simple. I've got two children, and my youngest is a a little girl. She's four years old, and she has long hair. And you can tell by looking at me, that's never a problem I've had to struggle with, personal long hair. And so each day, when it's my turn to get her ready, then I kind of look at her, and I think, how am I going to get her hair looking remotely presentable to the world outside? And there'll be ribbons there, and there'll be bows, and all of these things. She looks at me, I think with pity now that I'm going to try and do this, but she'll look at me, and I'll try and kind of mash kind of the hair into something which is slightly respectable, and we'll get her ready, and I'll take her downstairs, and I'll show her to her mummy, and I'll say, look, how does she look? Um, my wife will say, well, she looks okay, but you've put her dress on backwards. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Everything seems to confuse me about this little girl. But we are so easily confused, I find, in all sorts of different ways. The other day, I was just in front of the Victorian Albert Museum, just around the corner from here. And I was in front of it, and some uh, family just stopped me and they said, excuse me, could you tell us, are we on the right way to Buckingham Palace? And I said, well, kind of, yeah, if you carry on along this road, but you've got a long way to go. And I could see they were quite confused by this. They were thinking it was just around the corner. But I was like, actually, you've, you've still got quite a long way to walk. You might want to phone ahead and let them know you're running late. Confusion is all around us. It can leave us quite stressed at times. I don't know if you've ever felt that. When you feel confused, it can increase your stress levels. The Times wrote an article just this week, and it asked, the headline was this, why are we all so stressed out? Why are we all so stressed out? And the article said this, from the moment we wake, our brains are engaged. Whether we're scrolling social media before breakfast, paying bills online on the train platform, or asking Siri to dial a friend in the car, we're just constantly occupied the article goes on to say that actually what we should move towards is being task negative. Task negative, it sounds delightful, doesn't it? It means just having less to do, less tasks that will actually take up our time. Forbes magazine estimates that 853 million, sorry, billion dollars was spent last year on what's known as the attention economy. That means $853 billion was spent to get your attention and my attention fixed on something that people want to sell us or tell us or for us to hear about. There's a huge economy out there. There's a huge amount of interest in capturing our attention. But the impact of that attention economy 
the impact of it is not always positive. It can lead to diminished focus. How many of you have ever felt that, like when you're looking at one thing, but then you're distracted by something else, that when you go and then do that, it leads, it leads and you're just constantly distracted. It can manipulate our worldviews, and in some cases, it can lead to damaging relationships. That where our attention is being fought over, it can lead to an increase in our confusion. We struggle. I'm going to read a passage for us now. And the passage is from Luke's Gospel. We're going to be in the very final chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 24. And what I'd love for us, as we read this, I'd love for you just to notice where you think the confusion is taking place. Where in this passage do you notice confusion? And then we'll unpack it together. So if you've got a Bible, it's on page 1061, or it'll be on the screen above me, or if you've got your phone, you can look it up. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 13 all the way through to verse 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other and about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked alongside, along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up at once and returned to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised them by them when he broke the bread. Tom Wright describes this chapter, Luke chapter 24, as a masterpiece within a masterpiece. It is a beautiful passage of scripture that when we read Luke 24, we are seeing a masterpiece painted in it, we hear Luke describe the resurrection as a historical paradigm-shifting event. The resurrection is not an idea. The resurrection is not an ambition. We don't kind of say Jesus is risen as something that we think maybe happened, but we are stating an historical fact. Luke is telling us, like it or not, this happened. How are you going to respond? What does it mean to you that he is risen. This morning I want to say again that Jesus is alive. He is risen. He conquered death and that should change everything. It should change for us our direction. It should change our meaning. It should change the way that we recognize who Jesus is. As we read this story, as we read about this journey towards Emmaus, 
I want us to notice some of these moments where actually confusion does seem to weigh heavily on these two disciples. They get a bit confused about various things. And I just want to point each of these out and begin to ask, well, what does that mean for us today? What does that mean to us living in 2024 as we're trying to work out what it means to be a follower of Jesus? The first thing, the first thing that we notice in the very first verse is there seems to be some confusion over the direction they are traveling. Confusion over the direction they are traveling. Verse 13 says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Luke, in writing his gospel, the whole gospel moves towards Jerusalem. The whole time, it's, it's got this sense of movement that everything is moving towards this culmination in Jerusalem. Even at the very beginning, Luke chapter 2, where Jesus is dedicated in the temple. His parents take him to the temple in Jerusalem to be dedicated. In Luke chapter 9, Luke says that Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. So we can really see everything is moving in that direction. The week of Calvary, all the events leading up to the crucifixion, they take place in Jerusalem. So we've kind of been conditioned as we read this gospel. As we read this and we understand it, everything seems to be moving towards Jerusalem. Everything is getting closer to Jerusalem. And now we meet these two people and they're going the wrong way. They're leaving Jerusalem. So why is that? What does Luke want us to see here? What, what are we meant to be noticing? Well, we don't really know why Cleopas and the other disciple, we don't quite know why they were leaving Jerusalem. It may be that these early Christian followers who had gathered in Jerusalem, the 11 disciples, the women, the others who were kind of around, maybe it had begun to fracture a little bit, that group. Maybe after that third day, their struggles, it became that little bit more difficult and they'd begun to fracture a little bit. Or maybe just Cleopas and his friend, they said, you know what, we've been in Jerusalem quite a while, Let, let's go and clear our heads. Let's go on a nice walk, let's go on a seven mile walk to Emmaus. And so maybe they were just there, just trying to clear their head of everything that had happened. Or maybe it was more serious. Maybe Cleopas and his friend had given up everything to follow Jesus. And now Jesus was dead, they thought. And so maybe they were thinking, well, what should we do now? Is it time to return to our old life? The truth is, we don't know. The only clue we're given, the only thing that the passage tells us is that their faces were downcast. They were filled with disappointment. They were filled with grief. And their confusion was increasing. Their confusion over what was happening. The second thing I want you to notice is there's confusion over recognition. Confusion over recognition. The passage told us they were kept from recognizing him. That is Jesus. They were kept from recognizing Jesus. This seems to go beyond just recognizing him physically, but recognizing these moments that they'd spent with him, recognizing what had happened over these past few days, recognizing what the scriptures said. Because after they have described Jesus of Nazareth to Jesus of Nazareth, if you listen carefully to the passage, their faith moves into the past tense. They're likely heartbroken. They say things like, he was a prophet. They crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one. Everything now has moved into this kind of past tense. And there's that sense of heartbrokenness. There's that sense of confusion that they don't know why what has happened has happened. They did not recognize him. They did not understand who he was. And they did not understand why did he have to die? Confusion reigned. All their aspirations, all their hopes, everything that they put into following Jesus, they thought now lay dead and buried. The conversation continues. These disciples who don't recognize Jesus begin to tell him things that it seems like they don't understand the third is there is confusion over meaning. When you look at these few verses, what the disciples say, it's accurate. They say, you know, Jesus lived and then he died. They, they, they get that bit right. They have all the data, but it seems like they're missing the meaning. 
You can see everything. You can see a full picture, but not fully understand it. And that seems to be what's happening in this passage. They have the data, but they do not have the meaning. They hoped for a Messiah. But their Messiah, the the Messiah that they hoped for, was somebody who was going to come in and ride in on a war horse and destroy all of Israel's enemies. And yet, they say, they crucified him. This one we hoped for, they killed. The question they should have been asking now is not, did he live and then die? But did he die and then live? Did he die and then live? That is where the question is. You see, the problem does not seem to be in their head knowledge, but their heart. They need that understanding. Confusion reigned and the people felt lost. Now, you may relate to some of these moments. There may be areas in your life, areas in your faith where you felt confusion. There may be moments where you felt confused by what's taking place in the world. Maybe you felt at times, you know, my life, I thought it had direction, but now I've kind of gone off track and I'm not sure the way I'm meant to be traveling. Or maybe you're not even sure you're on the right track and you'd wish you'd gone another way. And so you begin to ask those questions that the disciples have got of where are we going? Where am I headed? What is this life all about? Or maybe you have a sense of not being sure on who Jesus is, that you would like to find out more, but you you find it confusing. You find it confusing that the saviour of the world would be killed And so you've got these questions like, well, what do I do with this information? What do I do now? Or maybe maybe you've been around for a while and you've heard all the information, you've heard the talks, you've read the word, but it's just like something is not clicked into place. You just feel like, I just feel like there's something that's not working for me. Something here just doesn't quite make sense to me. And it's like you're missing the key the key that could just unlock your confusion, the key that could just unlock the meaning or the recognition or the direction of your life. What I want to suggest to you and what I think the scriptures suggest to us is the resurrection is the key to unlock all of those things. Knowing that Jesus is risen will unlock our understanding of who Jesus is, will help us recognize what Jesus is doing and give direction to our lives. I want to show you this in just a couple of ways. The first, just for a moment, imagine you were walking on the Emmaus Road. In fact, I don't know if there is an Emmaus Road in London. Let's say you're walking on the Brompton Road. And as you're walking on the Brompton Road, you and a friend, you're just walking along and you're talking and you're looking downcast. You're looking a little sad. And as you're walking along, somebody comes up to you, a stranger comes up to you and says, hey, what are you two talking about? You, you look quite sad. And you look at this person slightly incredulously and you say, have you not heard? Have you not seen the news? The the world is at war. Artificial intelligence is taking everybody's jobs. Social media is frying everyone's brains. The political system is struggling. Many people in this country and in the world are struggling just to meet the basic needs all our hopes, all our dreams, they've all gone sour. Have you not heard? And the person, the stranger may look back at you and they may say something like this. Come on now. Come on. Do you not know that Jesus is risen? Do you not believe that Jesus has a plan? Do you not believe that at this very moment he is at work in this world through his spirit, that the Father's heart breaks for his creation, for he loves all that he has made. Do you not know? Do you not know? You see, if you are downcast about anything, if you are downcast about the state of the world, if you are downcast about the state of your life, the resurrection is good news for you. Because he is risen. It offers us meaning. The first thing, the resurrection will give you meaning. You see, the resurrection gives, and it's a promise for meaning for every single life. Nobody sits on the message of the resurrection. As soon as people find out, they want to go and tell others. When people hear that Jesus is risen, they think, right, I'm going to tell that to somebody else. It is a historical paradigm-shifting event. What that means is it changes everything. The resurrection is the hinge point of history. It is the moment when everything changes. You see, the resurrection brings together head and heart. It brings together understanding and application 
and it can give meaning. It can give meaning. But when we have meaning, we have to talk about it. One of the things I'd love for us to notice in this passage is that people speak to each other. It's not like a London underground. People actually speak to each other. It's incredible. They want to share what's happening. They want to share about what God has been doing because they dared to believe that Jesus is greater than they ever understood. This was not a dead man walking, nor was it a dead man talking. This was God in flesh. Jesus is risen. And that, they begin to realise, changes everything. Deuteronomy 6 tells us that whenever uh, we stand up, whenever we're walking along the road, whenever we lie down or get up, we should be speaking about God. We're encouraged to do this all the time, to speak to each other, to share what Jesus has been doing, to share the good news that he is risen. Those are the conversations that we're encouraged to have. As iron sharpens iron, so speaking about Jesus, speaking about the resurrection, it will sharpen your soul. It will sharpen your soul. Hebrews tells us we should spur each other on. Thessalonians says we should encourage each other and build one another up. The idea being that when we speak to each other, when as Christians we share the good news of what Jesus has done, it will transform us. It will change the way we think about the world. It will change the way that we think about our life and the meaning that it has. So speak about the resurrection. I don't know if you are uh, into murder mystery novels or kind of whodunit books, but if ever you've read one of those books, something like Murder on the Orient Express or Death on the Nile or any of those, you read the book and then when you find out the great reveal at the end, you find out who the killer was, then you can go back in that book and you can begin to spot the clues that were scattered throughout the book. You begin to say, oh, that's why that happened, or I didn't notice that before, or, or whatever it might be. You begin to spot on every page, every chapter, clues scattered pointing to that great reveal. Or you may remember a movie released back in 1999 called The Sixth Sense. The Sixth Sense was a famous movie, but it's the kind of movie that you can only see twice, really. The first time you see it, you watch it, and at the end, it has this great reveal, and spoiler alert here, the great reveal is that Bruce Willis, the character that he plays, is dead. I have just spoiled that movie. I apologise if you're going to watch it. But what happens is then you can go back and watch the movie, and everything else makes sense. Because you know how it ends, everything else begins to slot into place. What I want to suggest to you is that when you know that Jesus is risen then you can read the Bible and everything begins to slot into place. When you know that Jesus is risen, you can go back and you can spot all the clues in the pages of Scripture. And that is what Jesus is doing for the disciples here. He's taking them back through the Word and pointing out all the places in all the ways. Look, this is how it reveals who he is and what he came to do. When we know Jesus is risen, it brings us recognition. If you are confused about Jesus, the resurrection is key to make sense of both who he is and what he did. Jesus points to the scriptures. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, and then he begins to unpack it. That must have been the best Bible study ever. In fact, there'll probably be never as good a Bible study as that one that Jesus gave on that road on that day to those two disciples. You see, Jesus is greater than anyone dared imagine. They were hoping that somebody would come along and conquer their enemies. But Jesus came as an obedient servant who was humiliated, who was rejected, who was killed. And yet in the resurrection, in conquering death, he brings redemption not from deadly enemies, but from death itself. Jesus is risen. That is the message of good news for the world. Because when you know Jesus is raised from the dead then you know Jesus for who he truly is. He is the author and perfecter of life. And so finally, the resurrection, it can offer us direction. If you're confused in life about direction, if you're confused about the trajectory of your life, the resurrection is an anchor point, it is a moment, it is an event, an historical event which can give your life direction. You know, people often sense God before they can articulate what it is they sense. 
You know, you may have felt this yourself before you became a Christian. You may have felt that sense of, I can sense something, but I don't quite know what to ascribe it to. We see that in these two disciples. These two disciples, they, they don't initially know who Jesus is. But what's interesting is they don't want to be without him. When he intimates to move on at the end of that walk to Emmaus, they say, no, 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 please, Jesus, stay with us. They encourage him to stay for a meal. It's through that meal that their lives would turn around. The whole direction of their lives. Now, very practically, they headed back to Jerusalem, which is quite a commitment when you think about it, because they'd walked seven miles to Emmaus. Now they were going to walk seven miles back to Jerusalem. And I often wonder to myself, what did they talk about? What did Cleopas and that other disciple talk about as they walked back to Jerusalem? Because I don't know about you, but I'd be getting excited to tell all my friends back in Jerusalem, great news, Jesus is risen. And so they must have kind of talked between themselves and said, you know, should we, should we kind of burst into the room when we get back to Jerusalem and tell everyone just, Jesus is risen? Or should we kind of break it to them gently? We don't want to shock them and say, maybe we'll tell them we've been on a walk to a mayor, so somebody appeared to us and we had this great Bible study. Like, how should we do it? And so the two of them must have worked it out and they had their plan. But then what the passage tells us is when they get back to Jerusalem, they go back to their friends and before they can say anything, their friends would say to them, hey, guess what? Jesus has risen. Simon Peter's seen him. The women must have been sat there thinking, we told you so, we could have saved you a 14-mile round trip. <laughs> but I don't suppose they cared for a moment. I don't suppose they cared who shared the news. What mattered is not who got to say it, but the fact is that it was a reality. The fact is that Jesus is alive, and that was the only thing that mattered because now their life had direction. You see, Jesus is greater than anyone dared hope. Earlier this week, as I was thinking and praying and preparing this passage, um, I knew that there was a painting by uh, an artist called Caravaggio. And Caravaggio painted the supper at Emmaus, which is going to appear on the screen in a moment. And this painting, I, I googled it because I wanted to get an image of it. And you know when you Google something, it also tells you how to get to it sometimes. Well, I googled it, and what was interesting is when I googled the supper at Emmaus by Caravaggio, Google Maps said, this is seven miles away. I was like, oh, that, that feels a bit of a coincidence, doesn't it? And so I thought to myself, and then I tried to persuade the family, but they were having none of it. I was like, I'm going to walk there. I'm going to walk there, and I'm going to see this painting. And so I did that. So I walked, it's at the National Gallery. And so I walked to the National Gallery, and I went in, and I sat down, quite exhausted, sat down, and I looked at the painting. And the painting is fascinating because it kind of draws you into it. The artist Caravaggio has painted it in such a way where you feel drawn into it. There's almost like a space at the table for us. There's a space where you can just see and the two disciples sat down on either side. The one in green is just gripping onto his chair because they've just been told the amazing news. They've just, had their, just seen Jesus break bread and their, the scales have fallen from their eyes and they realise he is risen. The only reason Jesus was at that meal is that the disciples urged him strongly to stay. You know, they could have walked to Emmaus and got to the end of it and got to that Bible study and said, okay, we're done now. We're going to go to our home. See you later. Jesus will never presume on our hospitality unless we invite him in. Jesus will never presume on invitation unless you invite him in. Jesus must have wondered, were these two disciples going to be tired of him, bored of him? And I think in this week after Easter, as we're thinking about what does it mean for my life? What does it mean for me that he is risen? That is a question that we can ask ourselves. Because as Jesus is risen, we ask ourselves, are we going to invite him in? Or are we going to say, actually, Jesus, it's okay. Keep on walking. I've got it from here. I've got the data. I'll take it. But instead, we can invite him in. We can say, Jesus, come, eat with us. Jesus, come, fill me, fill, be part of my life. Speak to me, help me recognize you, give my life direction, give my life meaning. For each of us, we might respond to that in a number of ways. For some of us, if we do not know Jesus, then we can simply invite him into our lives. 
It may be that as you are wrestling with your questions, as there's confusion still, that you want a place to do that. And on the 15th of May, starting here in the morning or in the evening or online, Alpha will begin where you can come along and you can ask your questions. You can begin to be open and begin to just bring your questions into a safe space. But maybe you're here and you need to know Jesus. Can I encourage you and bring you back to that point I made earlier? That the disciples and everybody else never sit on the news of the resurrection. They talk about it with each other. If you're here today and you're part of a small group, part of a connect group, or if you're not, could I encourage you to join a connect group? Join with other Christians and encourage each other and spur each other on with the good news about Jesus with the good news that he is risen. We can build each other up in that way and it can change our lives. You see, Jesus is greater. He is greater than our confusion, for he is risen. Amen.